Hello and welcome to Autism in Conversation with Auticon, a podcast from Auticon, a global IT consultancy whose consultants are all autistic. This series is designed to help raise greater understanding and appreciation of autism through fascinating conversations with inspirational guests. Hosted by me, Carrie Grant, MBE. Each episode will feature brilliant guests from all walks of life who each share a passion for making the world more inclusive. We'll be talking about the many benefits of hiring neurodivergent talent through to some of the more common challenges faced by autistic adults navigating the workplace, plus much, much more. All of my four children are neurodivergent, so this is a subject that's very close to my heart, and I'm really looking forward to facilitating some great conversations about autism and hopefully learning some new things along the way. I hope you enjoy. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Autism in Conversation with Auticon. Now, as many of you who have listened to the podcast before will know, there are many, many benefits to employing a diverse workforce, and that includes neurodivergent talent. When it comes to bringing in autistic talent, making relatively minor changes or accommodations can go a very long way to helping make life more manageable by creating an environment that allows autistic people to thrive. Now, in this episode, I'm joined by a brilliant panel of guests. They are Clementina Gali Zugaro, who is a job coach at Auticon, Connor Ward, an autistic speaker, consultant and social media content creator, Gemma Harvey, freelance actor, creative support, writer and independent film and theatre maker. Helen Ellis, Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Coordinator at the National Autistic Society. And Hollyoaks actor and one of my children, Tylan Grant. Thank you everybody for joining me today. So if I could go to you first, Helen, could you start us off by explaining what we mean when we say someone is neurodivergent? Absolutely. Uh, I think the first thing to explain there is that all autistic people are neurodivergent, but not all neurodivergent people are autistic. Yes. It's very much an umbrella term that encompasses ADHD, dyspraxia, dyslexia, Tourette's. And it's about our brains being wired a little bit differently to what people would consider to be the typical brain. Um, That's not to say that neurotypical people are correct or or normal it's just they are the majority that that we encounter Uh, and those of us that are neurodivergent are perhaps seen as a little bit different I think that's a brilliant description we need to just clip that and just (laughs) put that out to everyone like you need to know what it meant this is it and so Connor when we're thinking about the workplace because that this particular podcast is about the workplace and the accommodations that sometimes you know our neurodivergent people will need particularly thinking about autistic people can you explain to people listening what we mean when we talk about accommodations in the workplace yeah so what it's about is removing barriers that are preventing an autistic person or any person from being able to do their job to the best of their abilities. So it can be a small change, it can sometimes be a a bit larger, but often, you know, it sometimes is just as simple as, can you please turn that light off? And it will massively increase uh, that person's ability to do the job how they want to do their job. Now, I always think that we make such a big deal, or not we, actually, I think it starts with school. For me, it's where school always made out like, oh my gosh, this is such a big burden to make one change. And and in actual fact, a lot of those things are really small adjustments. Like Connor, you've just said about, just turn the light off. Like literally, it's as simple as that. Um, for you, Clementina, working as a coach, what sort of stuff do you notice when you're setting up jobs for autistic people with companies and you're preparing the company for the person, the person for the company? What do I notice in terms of the challenges or of the accommodations? What accommodations would they need? So, as you say, often it's really quite small things. It it really depends on the individual, I would say. Everybody will have different needs, but um, there are some things that that can be done that kind of actually improve things for for everybody, neurodivergent or not, but will have a particularly beneficial impact. for autistic people or other neurodivergent um, employees. So it could be things like just looking at your communication and making sure that you are clear in your communication. So yes. maybe rewrite, re- checking in how you've communicated a certain thing. If it's 
clear to you as a reader um yeah just just making that kind of just thinking about that um then also things like letting people know what to expect before a meeting um sending an agenda and then summarizing it at the end um so these are just some examples of things that i guess should be common practice uh, but sometimes aren't and can make a huge difference. Tylan, for you, what changes have been made in the work? You, you, you're one of the lead characters in Hollyoaks. What changes were made for you and have been made for you? Um, I mean, I think from, from the jump, um, when it came to Hollyoaks, it wasn't really a case of even... Um, it being one thing for me and then them having to change. Like, I think from the beginning, um, they were very clear that they wanted to understand and um, help um, in any way that, that they can. Um, and so, I mean, even in the audition, they um, told me who I'd be seeing um, I guess the pro the process and stuff like that, and like I had done auditions before, but I had never had a an experience like that where they were actually um, kind of adjusting to other people's needs and like helping them in that way, um, so they know what's happening and like the little things like that. Um, I guess also just the reassurance on set and the, the clear communication as well. Um, and I mean, from the jump, it was like very clear that they were, um, not seeing me as a burden and it was a, a thing where they wanted to get it right. And, um, it was less on, I guess, me and more of just them doing things maybe slightly different or... I love what you're saying um, there, Tyler, about it being less on you I think so often autistic people grow up with that feeling like I've now got to see how much I can possibly shape shift and change my entire being in order to fit in with the world but you're talking about Hollyoaks actually them thinking differently they had a different mindset to perhaps the other experiences you'd had before yeah and and they wanted to know um things that maybe I would need help with or I would struggle with on set or things that would help and stuff like that. Um, they asked me um, beforehand, before I even got the part as well, my second callback. Um, and I really appreciated that because at first I was kind of nervous um, about speaking um vocally about like the things that I struggle with and my experiences because I thought maybe that would like make them not want to work with me or it would make me too difficult but they were super understanding and they wanted me to be honest and um yeah so it was really nice yeah, I think that. that's interesting how many people don't disclose that they are autistic for that very reason. They don't want to feel like they're a burden. And I feel like for you at that point, everything turned on its head almost. Like, hang on a minute, they're asking me what I want. I'm not, I'm not used to being asked what I want. What do I say? Yeah, you're yeah, used to having to change. like, what can you change about yourself? Yeah. And part Rather of than, like, that, what can we change? Yes, exactly, exactly. So, and part of that, of course, was the hiring of Gemma, who also happens to be here uh, with us. Um, tell us tell us about how you came to be working with Tylan on Hollyoaks. Oh, just listening to them speak makes me so happy <laughs> um, because to be a part of the process and hearing how much it changed their experience and will continue to change their experience um, is what the whole thing is about. Um, and I was lucky enough to be brought on as part of that project um, right at the beginning. Um, and Hollyoaks were looking to cast um, a new role, a brand new role, uh, a neurodivergent role. Um, and uh, I freelance for a company called Access All Areas. Um, and um, I was offered the opportunity to come originally just to work within uh, f for the casting process. Um, now, of course, I, I need to make it clear that um, 
Access All Areas had actually worked with the casting team at Hollyoaks previous to that um, because the brilliant work that they do is share awareness mm. um, and, and help people make the process more accessible. Um, so I was part of the casting process and then um, I went up to Liverpool um, because they saw 120 people um, that it was an open call which is incredible. And some of the some of the people coming into the room had never even been in an audition room before. Yeah. Um, so it was quite a big responsibility to make sure that that experience was the best that it could be for them. Um, and then they whittled it down as, as the audition process goes to six. Um, and then I worked one-on-one -on -one with those six um, artists and then uh well then, <laughs> we ended then, up with Simon. <laughs> um and then I was a part of the uh of shooting for the first few weeks um but what like what I have to make clear is from the word go Hollyoaks were so great at recognizing that they didn't know they didn't have all of the answers so they went and did the research and they found specialists in those areas to come in and and advise. And uh, that went across the company, you know. Um, uh, they, they spoke to the directors that were going to be involved. They spoke to production that were going to be involved. They spoke to script that were going to be involved. There, there was a lot that went into it. Um, but what... The reason why I like to try and share this story as much as possible is it is it's so simple. <laughs> it's about asking people who know, and I just think I am just talking about my industry particularly. It's so closed and it's full of people who are scared to ask, so they just don't do, and that's that's not okay. Yeah, that really isn't okay. And it is it is interesting to to note that I mean we Ty and I always say this that a lighting rigger on Hollyoaks has had more autism training than any teacher oh that my... ever taught Ty. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. There we go. Right there. Um <laughs> Helen, what's what's the experience? Obviously, you're you're looking at diversity and inclusion in the workplace um, at the National Autistic Society. What sort of challenges are there for people in terms of the accommodations that need to be made? Those changes. What things really help people, and what things are difficult for them? I think one of the biggest challenges in the workplace actually is some of the clashing needs for autistic people. We've got quite a lot of autistic staff. Uh, and so within our office, you might find that on the same floor, there's someone who really needs natural light and can't stand the artificial lights being on. But then there's also someone perhaps like me who really needs a lot of light to concentrate and so can't focus on just natural light alone. So we, we might even have thoughts those, about yeah. that. clashing needs. Oh gosh, <laughs> clashing needs. Yeah. So there are times you have to really be thinking, okay, well, we need to make sure those people sit on different floors, perhaps, so they can have control over their own area. Maybe we alternate the days of the week they come into the office, so they they work from home at different times. Um, but mostly, it's about talking to an individual and going, right, what is your sensory profile? What is the perfect workplace for you? And how close can we get to that within the realms of what is reasonable for everyone else in the workplace? Because as much as I would love to say no one in my office can wear perfume ever again, <sighs> that's not entirely reasonable to ask of people. Um, I can ask it on really important days. So if it's a day I'm doing interviews, perhaps, I can say to people, look, I need to be on my, on my best today. Can you please not do that? But not every day. Um, and it certainly isn't a case that I could ask people on the bus to not do it. So you always have to think about what the word reasonable actually means when it comes to those accommodations, as well as thinking about the fact that accommodations are for more than just autistic people. One of the key things we always say to managers when they're a bit kind of like, oh, I don't know how to make accommodations. Well, actually you do, because parents, you let them stop working at a certain time to go do the school run. If someone has a bereavement, you give them time away from the workplace to be ready to come back. If someone has other forms of need, you find ways to accommodate them. You just haven't thought about our needs before. Mm. 
You mentioned there, Helen, sensory profile and Clementina, what other sorts of uh, accommodations would be would there be apart from looking at someone's sensory profile when when you're linking up that person person to the job what other sorts of things may occur so when talking about autistic uh, employees in particular um i think of, there are many but some of the more common ones that we find in the workplace um can be around work patterns for example so some people like to work certain times of the day, they like to concentrate, maybe not have meetings for a while, um, like to work late in the night when no one's disturbing them. Um, so that could be one. Um, the kind of information uh, processing style that they might have and learning style, preferred learning style, um, not only preferred, but actually the one that they might thrive best on. So someone might be a visual um, learner and just not being presented with that means that they might actually not, you know, with, with the option of, of using visual tools, means that they might not um, work to the best of their ability. So giving space to that. Um, communication and communication preferences. Some people like to, uh, you know, talk on the, on, on the phone and some people like to have the video on. Some people really don't like any of that and would like written communication only. And there's anything between there as well. Um, so time frames um, help with deadlines and prioritizing. These are just some examples. So as you can see, it's, it can be very vast. Um, but I also, if I may, I um, wanted to latch on to something that was said earlier about um, kind of asking um, the individual about, you know, what their needs are. Um, and I think sometimes we also maybe put too much um, so we, we think, okay, once I've asked the individual, which is already the a great step, then we'll have the answer. But maybe that individual themselves haven't been asked before. They haven't really thought about it before. Maybe they've just been diagnosed. Maybe they haven't even been diagnosed. So I think even just opening it up um, as a discussion in the team, um, as like, you know what, do you, are you finding that this 8 a.m. meeting every day is working for you or... Maybe shall we try out something else? And then maybe the kind of trial and error um, approach can be really useful to finding out what someone's personal needs and adjustments might be. And Clementino, obviously, Tylan and Gemma both spoke about the kind of, I mean, Hollyoaks were gung-ho about getting it right. But is, is that your experience when you go into companies? Are companies willing, able, keen to make those changes? Or or do you feel like, oh my gosh, I'm really having to ask for a lot here? Um, well, the thing is, companies are people. So um, I think it's really hard to, on the one hand, you've got a company culture, which might be, um, in the best case, an inclusive company culture. So you'll see that reflected in all sorts of, you know, behaviours and policies in the company. Um, but th you still need the, the individual person as well and the other way around you could have a company which is really not inclusive but you might have a manager who's really interested in making oh, it yes. inclusive for people so I've had experience on of both of these situations of course if they come to us um, they have a willingness to be more inclusive because they're looking specifically for autistic talent yeah um, and then what you might encounter is anything from you know just real openness and curiosity and inquisitive approach to the particular circumstances of that individual but also some fear and maybe you know a manager has been put in a position to work with us but they they don't really know what to do and they haven't dealt with a situation like this before and don't know where to start um so in that case it's about also reassuring and educating even just the basics about what it what is autism and why you shouldn't be scared of thinking about adjustments around um, your autistic employees. Yeah. For you, Connor, if you were to have like the perfect setup, what adjustments would you, would you say you would need? That's a big question. Um, <laughs> to be at my home, first of all, because and then it's me who's in control of everything. Uh, however, that doesn't always work. Of course, well, like today, we're in person. Uh, one of the best things that was ever said to me in kind of a reasonable adjustment scenario 
uh, first of all, is like it was the validation of of going. Uh, this isn't a burden because I, I automatically feel if I've got to ask for anything, even in this context, like it, I feel like I'm being a burden. Um, but and then it, it was said to me, you shouldn't just be coping; you should have the potential to enjoy, um, and that makes a massive difference. Uh, so that kind of thing puts it in, uh, like, makes you feel at ease to be able to open up to be more um, defining on, on what are your things. So, yeah. for example, I need silence. You know, I, I, I any little noise will trigger me. Layered noise particularly really uh, does me in. When, when I was on the podcast last series, uh, I spoke about being in an open plan office that was six six stories and 6,000 keyboards typing and it drove me insane. <gasps> I remember um, that sentence. I think of everything we did in the last series, that sentence blew me away because it was about this open staircase wasn't it six flights <laughs> oh <my laughs> but but of course it you know it's, it's not just all it's not just all the sound it's all the smells it's all the it's all the light it's everything so for me i i really like a muted environment to be able to uh to be able to to have that and the advantage of what i like about working at home is in between meetings if i need to just go and lie actually in my bed i can and that's a brilliant adjustment for me it you know it it makes it seem like, oh, he's just needing, a, you know, some downtime. But my bed is my adjustment. And I, I feel very grateful for that most of the time I'm, I have access to that. Wow. I love that. I love the confidence with which you speak. And uh, Tylan, you, you talked earlier about being asked, um, you know, what do you need? How I'm thinking about other young people coming into the workplace. You were obviously 16 years old when you were asked that question. So you were super young going into the workplace. Um, how hard is it to speak up for yourself? Very difficult. Very hard. Yeah, I mean... Being autistic is, is I mean, there, there are layers of reasons why it's hard. Um, but I think that being autistic is just like the, the cherry on top. That it's just like, it sometimes makes it harder to advocate for myself because um, communicating isn't always easy for me. And also I sometimes doubt my own... Um, um perception if that makes sense yes so it's hard to know if I'm being a burden or if people are open to discussion and understanding or if there's an issue in the first place so it can be hard to advocate for myself for sure and was that hard is that hard because it was hard for you when you were younger at school yeah um yeah I think so I mean, with my experience in school, it, it was a case of, uh, like, you uh, you and my dad <laughs> uh, going to the school and, you know, telling them that uh, I was autistic and showing them the papers and everything and them completely um, disagreeing almost. Yeah, and, not even almost, definitely. <laughs> yeah, they said, they said the that proof. I wasn't oh, autistic. no, we don't believe it. Yeah. Yeah. So they said that they didn't believe me, um, which I've just I've just grown up with that a lot. Like I've grown up with I'm so used to people um, not believing me when I tell them or telling me that I don't look autistic or I don't act autistic. And um, it's the same people that would judge me if I, you know, don't hear them the first time or when I have to walk off to process things or, you know, when I start telling them about my favourite show for an hour. It's the same people that, that don't understand. Um, and it's that, like, lack of wanting to get it that I think, or denying it, that kind of makes it harder for people to be vocal about um who they are when they yeah. need certain things. Helen, it's hard to advocate for yourself, isn't it, if people aren't even accepting that you're autistic? 
I mean, it's one thing to to say I, I've got some needs. It's another thing where people don't even acknowledge the the very piece of paper that's written there that says that that you are who you are. Yeah, absolutely. I think you know most autistic people here listening at home will probably say you know if, if we had a pound for every time we'd heard you don't look autistic we'd all be billionaires yes. um and this is me we, we constantly have to fight not just in the workplace but in in wider world because so many of us have got so good at, at masking and not talking about our needs and finding our own ways of coping that quite often mean that actually we're we're dealing with the horrible side of, of what we go through in private where people can't see it. Um, and then on top of all of that, we're being called liars, essentially, because when we do ask for things, you know, that the response can be, but but why do you need that? You're, you're fine. You were fine yesterday. Why aren't you mm-hmm. fine today? Or that it's an excuse. Yeah. That's one of the things I must bring up now. You've just said that, Helen, is the thing of you didn't need this yesterday. Like, Connor, let's go to you. It's, it, it, surely autistic people, they, they're they allowed to be, like, varied <laughs> on different days. Yeah, we don't learn about ourselves. Like, we, we go through uh, the early stage of our life learning about ourselves as if we are neurotypical. Um, you know, even if diagnosed or stuff. So like, I was diagnosed at 18, so I had to learn myself over again at 18. Of course I'm still learning things now, even six la- uh, six years later. Um, I, I, like, I, I definitely feel that, um, that talking about my own needs, so in the workplace context, and I, I, in the workplace context, even, I've seen this for other people, has given me the confidence to then talk about my needs outside of that, to put it into, you know, social life, family life, etc. Um, yeah, I, 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 that confidence, I'm really quite happy that that's, it's brought me that. So one of the things we need to say is that all autistic people are different, plus all autistic people are different on different days. Yes. Can we add that extra bit to the sentence? For, for all we love consistency, we're not necessarily very consistent ourselves. <laughs> Who is? And, and also something that really has been brought to light there, you don't look autistic. Yeah. What I mean, what does that even mean? It's just horrible that that's what we are facing still. Exactly. Uh, yeah. But yeah, Helen and I were talking about briefly before about the concept of of the autism spectrum, because um, it's something that I don't necessarily feel covers, uh, you know, the the vast range of autistic people that you have nowadays. It's quite simple as autistic people are different people because we're different people, and people mm-hmm. seem to forget that point. But there are so many factors that make us diverse as humans mm-hmm. that that it's just not covered in in something as simple as as a spectrum. So yeah, it, it's about time that we just appreciate people as individuals and that's why we have to be so person-centric with things like this. Clementina, I'm thinking about those people that go for jobs um, that need those adjustments, those accommodations and yet there are so many people who are, I was going to say yet to be diagnosed, maybe they never will get diagnosed actually because it's, you know, we, we, still, we know it's still a big problem even getting an assessment these days. Um, are there people that Autocom would work with who perhaps have those autistic traits but don't have the piece of paper that says, and do you still work with those guys? So we are working on understanding how to do that just from a, um, you know, perspective. Because we, we, our social mission is, um, of course, giving employment to autistic individuals who are um well, the, even w- within the diagnosed uh, community, it, the unemployment rate is, is staggering. Um, so those are the, it has that's been the main focus of the company so far. But we also understand that it's really hard to get a diagnosis, um, and there's a lot of uh, waiting. There's a lot of waiting times on top of biases, even in the medical community. Um, so it might not be the easiest thing for someone to get a diagnosis. So we're kind of working on that right now, where. Yes, we do need to give priority to individuals who have been diagnosed and have not been able to um, to get employment, but we also don't want to exclude those that, yes, may have autistic traits um, and may not have gotten to a diagnosis just yet. Um, and at the same time, we're also learning a lot about neurodivergence in general because we're finding that a lot of there's a lot of co-occurring conditions. So we may have started with autism, um, but now we're 
also just widening our understanding of of ADHD and and dyslexia and how the the you know how the various conditions also overlap and how they interact um and what adjustments may be needed as a result of that as well yeah there's a lot of overlap for sure i know that from having four neurodivergent children you sort of go hang on a minute that's the same thing that's in this one but they've got totally different labels as it were um so we've got this question here what are the top three things organizations can do to make their workplace more inclusive helen oh um I think it's the workplace culture that is the main thing. Anything a workplace does has to come from the top. It has to be believed in by everyone in in the leadership because it's all very well writing lovely policies and putting nice slogans on the wall and saying you do all this stuff if it's not consistent across a whole company or business or organisation. You can't just survive on good little pockets of, of good practice on really good managers and hoping that you get that manager. It's got to have that consistency of everyone saying, yeah, we believe in this. This is the right thing to do. Why wouldn't we do it? You need that attitude of why wouldn't we be this way for autistic people? Why wouldn't we create an environment where someone can ask for an adjustment as and when they realise they need it? And it needs to, to be led from the top always. I love that. We don't need three things because that one thing covered everything. Uh, so that's the culture. I think that's uh, that's got to be. I mean, I thought you kind of summed it up there so brilliantly. Uh, has anyone got, got anything else? Uh, Clementine, I'm thinking about the work that you do. Uh, what what makes the biggest difference? Um, if I may, just add to what um, was brilliantly summarised just there, and also to go back to something that was said earlier. Um, one, well, you know, about how you don't look autistic or um, are you sure you didn't need it today because you didn't need it yesterday? Um, and in some cases, it's less uh, obvious that you're actually doing that to someone autistic by just asking, are you sure you need that assisted technology? Um, are you, you know, are you sure you need those headphones? Even if it's just like a confirming question, it puts into question why that person that may have needed a lot of you know, bravery to come up to you and ask for that adjustment and just puts it again into question, which will probably make that person feel more insecure, more like a burden. So that element of just accept what people may need without asking, without judging. Of course, there is, you know, if, if it's something that is impossible to deliver, um, like I think Helen was saying earlier about, you know, you, you need to also have conflicting needs met and so often. Um, but the judgment part and the not asking is a bit part of it. For you, Tylan, what would you say are the things that you most need when that would really be big for you? I'm, I'm sure that actually there are things that happen at Hollyoaks that they're now so much a part. They're so ingrained in your working life that um, you may not even be aware of them anymore because they just sort of sit there, don't they? But what are the, mo what are the big things for you? <laughs> uh, I'm going to say, what about really freezing cold sets that you had to work in the other day? Yeah, but there are some things that I, I, I think some people... Uh, there are things that I, I've been doing that I didn't know that I could ever do um, when it came to working and I think it's because of the environment um like I've realized that I can um deal with more um, I guess um I think what you're saying there I ties I, really no I, this is really really important because you just said something that I really truly believe in which is if you meet someone's needs and you accommodate for them the demands go down because and their tolerations go up because when you feel heard and you feel like people are getting you and they will make those accommodations it's like you can sit back a little bit I think there are things that you do now that you would yeah it's less about like my potential, like what I could do, but I can't because I'm like, however I am. And it's more about like my capacity um, 
And when people are, I guess, rooting for me in that way, my capacity is a lot bigger. Does that make yes. sense? Yes, it totally um, does. So when people are rooting for you, your capacity grows when people are listening. <laughs> Uh, when we create that culture that Helen was talking about. I just, I feel like everyone has basically ex like expressed yeah. or answered the question so well, I don't know what to say. I think you said, <laughs> what you said was great. You added a whole new dimension. Connor? One thing I'd really love to see organisations do more is give the opportunity to facilitate needs-based conversations, whether that's bringing in neurodiversity training, you know, however often or just saying once a month do you know what we're all going to talk about what we need take it out of this whole um you know as you were saying earlier about uh people who need maternity leave etc all, all that kind of stuff um just facilitate that conversation because ultimately if you don't have the education you may not know what your own needs are so i would love to see uh organizations taking more of an effort to be educating their staff as to what needs are so that uh, their employees can vocalise their own needs a lot more. I really like that. Yes. Gemma, any thoughts on that? Oh, there's so much. Um, well, the, the way in which I approach each artist is we start with a sentence. Um, I am Gemma and I need. Um, and obviously that covers everything that we've been talking about. But that encapsulates the fact that each independent artist's needs are completely different. Um and that is brilliant when I'm working one-to-one -one and for productions who recognise the importance of, of that process and that, those relationships. Um, but we need the industry to take it much, much bigger yeah. because it needs to be ingrained way back when. Um, we need to see more neurodivergent people within production, script, casting directors, um, uh, across the board because if there are more people at those stages of production then they're going to understand how to make a production accessible and it's going to be thought of way way back so then when we get to the point that we're on set there's already going to be a person in that job that is perfect for that job and it will actually save time and money yes but people are so scared even asking the questions and then it goes back to again you know educating and having companies you know wanting to to understand and if they don't if they don't understand then going out to find out find people who can help them finding those experts yeah. like you said earlier absolutely so what i'm hearing here is culture change mindset change we've talked a lot about that um, I think something you just said there, Connor, was really important, knowing your needs, actually knowing what you need. And so often if you've not been asked what your needs are or your needs have been or your parent asking for your needs when you were younger were just completely overlooked, how are you meant to learn how to advocate for yourself? So actually understanding your own needs. I think we talked about the flexibility as well that's needed, that some days may be different from others, some seasons may be different from others. And also, if you're in a great environment, you may become more tolerant. So therefore, things could change or and other things might suddenly, uh, you know, life might throw a curveball and you're less tolerant. And so therefore those needs might need to increase. So the flexibility of that. And then finally, what you were saying, Gemma, about inclusion across all jobs. So it's not just, oh, we've got an autistic person coming to work in our company. Let's get some training. You know, it's actually autistic people, neurodivergent people being put sprinkled you know, all the way through all the different areas, including the top jobs, including on boards, including production, including, you know, wh whatever that happens to be. That's I've just mentioned creative words. But, you know, whatever field of endeavour we are in, actually having neurodivergent people, autistic people involved on every level. I just want to thank our guests today. Thank you so much to Clementina Gali-Zugaro, Connor Ward, Gemma Harvey, Helen Ellis and Tylan Grant. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. We really hope you enjoyed this episode of Autism in Conversation with Auticon. This episode was recorded in April 2022 and contributors are using community preference language at this time. Recording and production was at Strathmore Studios in Clerkenwell, London, and it was engineered and edited by Billy Godfrey, and music was by The Lethargies. 
If you'd like to know more about the podcast, would be interested in applying for a job as an Auticon consultant, or would like further information about how Auticon can help support your business, please visit auticon.co.uk. That's all from us this time. Bye for now.